Today, we hear from Dr. Christopher Milan, an expert in the archaeology of the first civilizations of prehistoric Peru. In particular, he studies the ancient temples and villages of the Manchai culture, and how this culture developed across time. We talk about the origins of Andean civilization, the role of shamanism in Andean prehistory, and the experience of doing fieldwork in the Peruvian deserts, along with much, much more. With that said, my name is Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Thanks for joining me, Chris. appreciate it. Absolutely, Seti. It's uh, nice to meet you. Well, first of all, when I was reading about your research, it, it was exciting to me in the sense that I'm, I'm really interested in the process by which complex societies emerged around the world. And I've kind of, I, I remember from, from classes, especially in my undergrad, sort of hearing about like the classic sort of hearths of civilization, the mm-hmm. cradles of civilization, and the Peruvian coast being one and, and kind of a unique one in a lot of ways. But, but the particular area that you work in and the culture that you study, I know like next to nothing about. So the, the Manchai, would you mind starting by kind of painting a picture generally of where you work and what it looks like? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So like you said, Peru represents one of the classic cradles of civilization where yeah. we see complex society emerge. Mm-hmm. And when we evoke that word, we often think of the works of great men, great archaeologists in right. that old, old 20th century sense, like yeah. the Gordon Child, yeah, yeah. Um, the godfathers of Peruvian archaeology, like Max Ule and Rafael Larco Herrera in particular, uh-huh. and of course my personal favorite mustache enthusiast, uh, August Pitt Rivers. <laughs> but one of the fun things about Peru is that it's really unique from all those other first places. It mm-hmm. kind of breaks the rules in some really weird and particular ways that are representative of its environment and right. also some of the later events that we see and how it just transforms into something truly spectacular and weird. Mm-hmm. And I do like using the word weird for this because it is such an alien culture in ways and how it represents itself, how it organizes itself and just presents a different type of society than one that might be readily understandable to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it starts with the climate itself, because even though we're talking about the Pacific coast of South America and just a scoot uh, south of the, of the, of the equator. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tropical, but it's not. So like right now we're talking in late February. So it's the end of summer and if you're in the city of Lima, the capital of Peru, yeah. the temperature right now is probably in the mid to upper 70s. Maybe on a scorcher day, it's going to be in the, upper, in the low to mid 80s yeah. with a humidity someplace hovering in the 80s or 90s. It just gets so balmy there. Hmm. But here's the weird thing. It never rains. Right. Because the image I have in my head is kind of the phrase I remember from undergrad courses is the coastal desert. Yeah. And, and I guess I also remember like fishing, marine productivity. Those are sort of the two key phrases. And those two are absolutely the most crucial to understanding the environment. So it is a giant desert that runs all the way up from the border with Ecuador. In fact, that is specifically known as the Satura Desert, which Mm -hmm. serves as a huge cultural barrier between Ecuadorian and Peruvian prehistoric cultures. Uh So it's easy to think that this is a product of national archaeology, but the Satura Desert serves as this huge barrier on the north of us. And to the south, we have the Atacama separating us from Chile. Right. And in between, it really is desert. Like, it's interspersed with areas of very vibrant green. Mm -hmm. But those are the product of a series of coastal river valleys that start up in the western slopes of the Andes Mountains and then trickle down into the ocean. Yeah, yeah. So those create these really nice verdant bands where you can see civilization really start to pick up. Yeah. But even then, like you said, it starts right with uh, with fishing. And that's where we get the next big, uh, big break in all of this is the Humboldt Current, which right. is the richest cold water current that you find in any fishery in the world. In the 1970s, there was a scholar named Michael Mosley who did a lot more work with later cultures, but mm-hmm. he proposed in particular what's known as the Great Maritime Hypothesis, that complex society in Peru started with fishing, not agriculture, because the Humboldt Current is so rich, right. you could just pop, pop a hut right on the beach, cast a line, go clam, uh, clamming every other day, yeah, and you're set. Yeah. yeah. And that's the first weird part of, or the origins of Peruvian civilization. 
Mm -hmm. Agriculture does come and it does come fairly early, but it's not a big deal to the point that... Right, compared with the Indus, the Yellow River, Mesopotamia, there's almost like a truism. Complex urban societies come out of specifically fertile river valleys. Exactly. And while we do have fertile river valleys, Mm -hmm. they're not as substantial as any of those. Um, The Lorene Valley, which is where I do my work, it is very tiny. Um, I want to say that from mouth to where you see the confluence of its two main tributaries, and I'm using that term very loosely here because they're tiny rivers at that point, you're looking at a distance of no more than 70 kilometers. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 And I'd have to pull up the exact number for how much of that basin is arable land, but Mm -hmm. it's not significant. (laughs) And there are bigger river valleys too, but in every single case, you're going to notice it's that very tight band of green farmland, and then it's separated from the next valley over by a really harsh desert and mountains. Mm -hmm. So that... It does provide that agricultural basis eventually, but first we have a bunch of beach bums enjoying some fish on the ocean. And to your point about, you know, comparing it to the Indus Valley or Mesopotamia, if we look at around 3000 BC, Mm -hmm. you do see some early temples. Most notably, you see them in the Amazonian rainforest on the eastern slopes, most notably sites Mm -hmm. like Kotosh, which was excavated by the Japanese in the 1960s and 70s also a really fun site if you're ever looking for like a deep dive into just how weird formative peru is kotosh is a thing but how do you spell that uh k-o-t-o-s-h but i digress so so um, this initial kind of flowering of of urban uh urban societies roughly when does it start that that's a good question and so kind of an open question it is, because also it begs the question of, are we looking at urban societies in ancient Peru? And it's yeah, a, is urban the right word? I, I mean, don't know. I mean, words like that and like civilization and complex, they're definitely kind of fraught in, in the world of anthropology anyways. Absolutely, um, they are loaded. And in the case of uh, Peru, I would say that Complex complexity definitely does work for us mm-hmm. with some serious qualifications, mm-hmm. but urban, not so much. I wouldn't say that there is a city uh, or anything that I would even start to argue as a city until at least 200, 380. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not for a lack of population density or complexity as we might identify it. It's just... No one built these massive, massive centralized places of population in the way that we would recognize them in any substantial anthropological way. Mm -hmm. Instead, what we find are these early fishing villages. And so back to 3000 BC. Mm -hmm. So around 3000 BC, we have stuff going on in the eastern slopes in the Amazon. Yeah. And then on the western slopes, we have some interesting stuff as well. In the Norte Chico region, which is just north of Lima, hence the name Little North, um, we have the Norte Chico culture, which is mm-hmm. centered around um, Caral. Yeah. C-A-R-A-L, yeah. not to be confused with Cardal, which we'll talk about later. Um, Caral, would, Caral might be a city. The lead archaeologist at the site, a woman named Ruth Shadi, she claims it's a city, but... I've never been a big, uh, big believer in that particular claim about the site. It's, hmm. it's huge, but was every single big pyramid there in use at the exact same time? Right. Probably yeah. not. Right. And then on top of that, that doesn't necessarily correlate to a large population where the residential sector hasn't been as thoroughly excavated and doesn't seem to indicate a huge, huge population. So. Mm-hmm. It might be it might be a large settlement, but to call it a city city, it's highly debatable. Yeah, yeah. But it was part of a network. There were a number of other temples in this Norte Chico region emerging around three thousand to two thousand BC that are engaging in long distance trade, not mm-hmm. just along the coast, but going into the Amazon to get highly sought after plant resources including medicines that would have been used in religious ceremonies. And also they were getting agriculture through the Amazon. The earliest through evidence, the Amazon. Oh yeah. The earliest evidence that we might have for agriculture dates to maybe 10,000 BC, and that would have happened in the Amazonian basin. Whoa. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. That's really cool. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's wild. Um, a scholar I'd recommend to look up for in terms of early agriculture is the late great Donald Lathrop, who wrote one of my favorite articles of the '70s called "Our Father the Cayman, Our Mother the Bottle Gourd," hmm. and in it he posits that the most important crop that leads to the creation of agriculture as we know it in South America is the bottle gourd. And why is that? Um, first off, it seems like it might be the oldest. Um, hmm. One of the th- reasons we think that is that it's not native to South America. It's native to West Africa. So, oh. yeah. Its cultivation is this weird, complex, and still huh. debated issue but if Lathrop in the 1970s was correct, it would have been probably the first cultivar that people started to experiment with. And yeah. from there, the, I understand the idea of how you can get this one crop that is such a clutch thing to have in your uh, tool arsenal. Yeah. Then led them to think, well, if we can goose the system to make sure this plant thrives, can't we do it with other plants as well? And so from there, we see the domestication of a number of important cultivars, including cotton, Mm -hmm. manioc, chili peppers, coca leaves. Yeah, yeah. But I should go back and say that the most important for our story right now, aside from the bottle gourd, is cotton. These are the two that are the most important and the ones that are going to get to the Pacific Coast earliest. And they're going to inspire also indigenous people on the Pacific Coast to start playing around with their own crops and seeing what they can grow as well. Yeah. Bottle gourds, though, serve an important function in an early pre-agriculture or quasi-agricultural society. First of all, they're your containers. Yeah. <laughs> Lathrop yeah. used to do this in lectures from what I've heard. I really wish I got to meet the guy while he was alive. He apparently was a real character. But he would walk into a classroom with a bottle gourd in one hand and a knife in the other. And he would start slicing the bottle gourd and <laughs> doing so... First off, and hence the name, he'd make a bottle. Just cut the top off the neck of it, and you've got a long neck and a globular body. Yeah. There you go. Then he'd cut the neck completely, or down to like just about an inch or so, and you've got a jar or canteen. Yeah. If you shave off the neck completely so you just got a, almost a perfect sphere, that's a necklace oya, which is typically the first type of ceramic vessel we see in <laughs> early assemblages. You can make bowls, you can make plates, you can hollow out the middle of it so you can make a corn nut toaster. Like, Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, every ceramic vessel in the early assemblage comes from bottle gourd. And we can imagine that the first ceramics were you cover your bottle gourd in dirt in, in wet mud, put it over a fire, let that mud bake, and there you go. Yeah. And the other thing that they would have been useful is as floaters because they're relatively hollow plants. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, time to run your net. Yeah. Drop it yeah. in, and there you go. Of course, that begs the question, what are they using to make their nets? Mm -hmm. And that was probably cotton. Aha, right. Yeah. Makes sense. So So they they didn't come in. That's that's really cool to think about. The first first cultivated plants are coming in sort of as as secondary to fishing. Mm -hmm. They're they're, they're coming in as... as, uh, uh, Non-foodstuffs. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Huh. Yeah, and so that gives us our setting as a place where complex society is already going to do its own weird thing compared to what we might predict. Because yeah. we've got permanent villages. They're mm-hmm. thriving on the ocean fishing, and they start farming. But instead of thinking of farming the way we would expect them to, it's more, this is great. Now we can catch more fish. And with that, also then start we see a population growth, and we start to see the first temples. Not on the central coast near the city of Lima, but in the north in the northern area, in places like Corral. Uh-huh. Nearby is also another site called Aspera, which is right on the coastline. Um, a very famous site that's been worked by a number of scholars, including Tom and Sheila Pizorski, is known as Las Aldas, A-L-D-A-S. Mm-hmm. It actually was originally called Las Algas with a G, because it was a place where seaweed used to wash up right on the shore. Huh. So we have a number of these early temples, and it suggests yeah. that marine, uh, marine-based marine culture really did thrive in Peru all the way up to about 2000 BC when we start to see what we would call the quote-unquote initial period. Mm-hmm. And that's where the story in the area around Lima really starts to take off and get to the research that I'm interested in. How do we piece apart, in, in your mind, to what degree, uh, say, a, a religious class of people... 
of, of priests or shamans or, or religious practitioners is, is a hierarchical sort of uh, phenomenon. That's the tricky one, especially at sites in the Norte Chico region, mm-hmm. because Shadi started excavating there in the early 90s, and she never really found anything that you would call like a royal grave or evidence for right. the ruling elites of the Norte Chico. Yeah. The closest we got is a guy named Robert Feldman in the 1970s who excavated at Ospero, where he found a couple of graves on one of the pyramids, specifically the one known as Huaca de los Sacrificios, mm-hmm. which is a very telling name right there, um, and that there were human remains on top of that pyramid. The huh. most evocative of them was the grave of a small child. And this child was buried with shell jewelry. Uh, and so what makes that really unique is why is this kid being buried in a place of prominence? Yeah, sort of a classic classic archaeology tell, I suppose, would be adults can earn prestige in their lifetime. Children, the question arises immediately, where did that prestige come from if they're being treated specially? Is yeah. it inherited? Who is it inherited from? Yeah. Whose kid is this, really? Yeah. And uh, combined with the jewelry, that really does give us a sense of prestige, but it's hard to really parse out since it represents almost a one-off fluke in that sense. We don't have anyone who follows up on this tradition, so it could be that maybe we saw one moment where one priest really went for it, built up a power base that led to significant, I'm going to call them financial gains because that's really hard to quantify it otherwise in terms of you got jewelry. What else is there? Some kind of material wealth. Yeah, exactly. But then it just kind of disappears into the ether. Mm -hmm. And part of that might also have to do with the way that we think about religious figures in and Dean culture. When we're talking about shamanism, we're talking about a different type of religious power than what we would see normally vested with, uh, with priests or other authority figures. Mm -hmm. Part of that has to come with the idea of the way that shamans interact with the supernatural realm, in particular in the Amazon and Andes, but this is also true about other parts of the world, especially in West Africa. Shamans are playing with totemic magical forces that are considered dangerous. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're they're basically handling radioactive nuclear waste, Mm -hmm. the type of thing that- It's like a mediator. Exactly. Yeah. And so when they're doing their job right, They're performing magic. These are Mm -hmm. the things that make the world go round and raise humanity up to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when they screw it up, well, you're handling radioactive nuclear waste. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. So in that sense, you often will see that shamans don't necessarily have a place of prominence or prestige within a community. They can often be relegated to a distant place where... Mm. If things go well, great. We'll come by your house. We'll pay you money to do your thing. But otherwise, they're kind of safely in the fringes. For when things go horribly wrong. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And it's something that still carries on to this very day to a degree. In Peru, you see a lot of people who still practice in some way, shape, or form what's known as curandismo, Andean folk religion. So one of my colleagues who I've worked with in the central coast of Peru, a guy named Fidel Fajardo, He's a practicing shaman, and when we start our excavations, we usually ask Fidel to carry out a blessing or a ceremony to make sure that the spirits around us give us good fortune, help us find what we're looking for, and hopefully don't kill us, you know? And even when you don't have a shaman uh, on on hand, it still (laughs) is good custom to engage in what we call uh, pago la tierra, or payment to the earth. Mm -hmm. So at every excavation that I've led, I've always made sure to do a pago. Back when I was chain smoking, usually involved at least one <laughs> cigarette. I mean, cigarettes always, you know, very useful for these types of rituals because you're burning an offering of some kind. Right, yeah. That and also when you think about in North American traditions, tobacco was a sacred plant like that too. So it yeah. kind of fits the bill. Yeah. But in South America, we have our own spe- uh, special plant that we like to use for these rituals, coca. So you'll often buy a bag of coca. Everyone gets a couple of leaves to chew on. And then you yeah. bury a couple of leaves with your cigarette. And it pays dividends. Like, it sounds weird and might sound even really silly and superstitious, but 
The Pagos mean that you can feel a little bit safer about your site. And who knows? Maybe there is going to some, someone that's going to push you along the way and find what you're yeah. looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And so could you talk a bit more about your period of focus, your time period of focus, uh, the initial period, and sort of what the chronology is and, and what it looks like uh, is happening during that time? Technologies, social change. So the initial period is uh, uh, is a very uh, large period of time, mm -hmm. and it starts sometime between 2000 and 1800 BC on the central coast of Peru. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that it extends all the way up to about 800 to 700 BC. Mm -hmm. So it's a long period of time, and yeah. it depends on what you want to use as your marker for when we begin the initial period proper. Yeah. One of the best uh, markers that we can use for it is the introduction of ceramic technology. And also with, uh, with temple construction, right? Mm -hmm. The initial period in the central coast of Peru does start around 2000 BC yeah. with the emergence of U-shaped temples as the dominant form of monumental architecture. Mm -hmm. And in that, we have two really clear examples that say 2000 to 1800 BC is when the initial period starts. Yeah. The first is Waka La Florida, which is located in the Rimac Valley, and that was excavated by Tom Patterson and then revisited by Jose Luis Fuentes Sandowski in the late 2000s. Mm -hmm. And the other is Mina Perdita, which is located in the Lorreen Valley, yeah. and that was excavated by Richard Berger in the late 1990s. And he also got carbon-14 dates that suggest it was built as early as 2000 BC. Wow. Yeah. Visually, what, what do these temples look like? Like if I were to go to one right now as just a tourist, can I see remnants of the excavations? Can I see much sort of standing above the surface? Is it mostly like kind of m mounds and sort of eroded stuff that could get reconstructed for tourists if they wanted to? or like None of them are going to be reconstructed, unfortunately. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a darn shame because the best preserved ones are in rather remote areas where they just look like giant dirt pyramids standing over farm fields. Mm -hmm. And the best example of that is the one that Dr. Richard Berger is excavating right now, which is Cardal, with mm -hmm. uh, the D in there. So C-A-R-D-A-L. Yeah. Cardal is one of the later temples. Probably was built sometime between 17 and 1600 BC. Mm -hmm. So it's a successor of Mina Perdita in that sense. But you get the clear look of it. You get this large earthen mound that represents the main body of it. And mm -hmm. it's a long, uh, long structure. It runs from east to west. I want to say it's about 150 meters in, um, in length from end to end. That's pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not a small... Not a small structure. And that's also fairly tall. I want to say it's at least 10 to 15 meters hot high. And all the U-shaped temples have a similar pattern where they have that one main pyramid and then on each side of it is one of the two arms. So the arms are equally as long. And mm -hmm. this is something that me and Richard had discussed because his theory on how to date these temples or one of the things to date them is that the oldest temples are always bigger than the more recent ones. Mina Perdita and Waka La Florida are hands down two of the biggest um, hmm. U-shaped temples in the region. The only one that's bigger is San Jacinto in the Chancay Valley that no one's excavated. So could it be older? Yeah. There's a non-zero chance that it might be the <laughs> oldest uh, U-shaped temple in the region. Someone should excavate that. <laughs> I know. But... Um, that the weird thing is like you have that width with them. So they're as wide yeah. as they're going to be from the start. And yeah. then the temp, the arms then extend another good stretch, another mm -hmm. hundred or so meters. Yeah. So you have these, this long U shaped structure. And then in the middle is a perfectly flat, uh, plaza, which would have been the area that public events would have happened on. Yeah. Imagining what's going on at these sites. I, I assume we have to imagine that there's sort of the the focal point culturally for something really important that that kind of the broader i don't know if the word hinterland is is a good one but but like the broader community of other settlements i'd imagine in the area kind of all have a vested interest in that people probably all contributed to the construction of these sites because it would have taken a huge amount of laborers right and these are the questions that me and my colleagues are especially interested in yeah and so that's why the, the first u-shaped temples represent this big moment where we're now in the initial period as opposed to the archaic period yeah 
by creating these temples, they're changing their lives in a number of radical ways. Yeah. Because yeah. these are the first inland settlements. The first vill- uh, permanent settlements we find in the, uh, on the central coast are farming villages right along the coastline. Mm-hmm. But Mina Perdita means that you committed to living inland 24-7 for all 12 months. And that it comes with the idea that agriculture is now a much more important part of their lifestyle. because It's eclipsed the, the fishing yeah, and the temple seems to have been a part of that. It becomes yeah. the locus for it. And um, we do believe that the temples were built in spots which allowed them to manage and control irrigation in distinct parts of the valley. Oh, interesting. Okay, so they had like kind of, they, they may have had like an administrative function beyond, say, merely like a religious ceremonial sort of sort mm-hmm. of function. Yeah. Yeah, so we can see each one of these temples representing a distinct community that were dependent on each other. Yeah. And that's where we start to see what I think is at the heart of complexity in particular in Peru. Not this hierarchical idea of someone's dictating the laws. Yeah. But you're in this together. Yeah. The need for larger groups of humans to function together. (laughs) Yeah. You can't, like, if you want to start farming in the central coast of Peru on your own in 2000 B.C., Good luck with that. You, you, you've you got maybe about a year before you're going to give up on that. Yeah. But if you, me, and 500 other people think we can do this, we can because we yeah. can take turns rotating who cleans the irrigation canals. We can yeah. uh, work together to pull up for contingencies when a, there's a bad harvest. Yeah. And not only that, but realizing that this is a big project, one beyond the scope of anyone's brains at that time because – who would have thought you can grow your food all year round? That's new. It's revolutionary. The temple then serves also as kind of a moral support for that. It's yeah. the ideology of we're in it together and we're going to build this community as a group. Yeah, the, the 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 mythic or religious sort of structure has a function galvanizing all of this organization and all of this cooperation that, that would be necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's one of the most important things that we can think about as, you know, uh, uh, for culture in any part of the world is yeah. creating the basis for people to feel that there is a larger purpose to working together. Yeah. Yeah. So in the sense that each one of these temples represents their own distinct community, it's kind of questionable if there was much of a hinterland or a dramatic pull beyond the immediate community centered around one of these temples. Right. So, for example... Mina Perdita is the first, but then it was probably shortly thereafter followed by Cardal and Manchai Bajo, both mm-hmm. of which are less than two kilometers away. Further down the line, you see a site called Parca, which was bulldozed by land developers in the 1990s from the northwestern corner of the main pyramid of Mina Perdita to the southeastern edge of the main pyramid of Parca. It's not even a kilometer. Yeah. So they're all in close proximity, and that suggests that the pull isn't that far reaching. I guess that that it makes a lot of sense why you would then also look at some of the the village sites that you look at sort of in the vicinity. Could you talk about uh, like Anchukaya and uh, Malpazo kind of in relationship? Yeah, so those represent the earliest settlements that we see in the middle section of the Lorene Valley. So the way I got in, involved with Malpaso was when I was in my first year of grad school, uh, one of my cohort mates who was preparing to go off and excavate at his dissertation site and he had been torn about going between Malpaso and another site close to the north, uh, in the northern coast city of Trujillo called Caballo Muerto. Mm-hmm. And he went with the latter, Caballo Muerto, and did great work there also. But Malpaso was still open. And one day he saw me reading a book and he said, you know, I was thinking about my site Malpaso, Chris, and I think that this site fits you. Would you like to take a look at it? And I said, sure, let's sit down, pull up Google Earth. He showed me his preliminary photos and I just fell in love. But then there's the other thing, you know, you have to justify, it seemed like a fun idea in the first place to your, your, uh, your committee. Yeah. And my advisor at the time, he knew Malpaso, he wanted one of us to excavate it, but he was of the belief that it was a later site. Hmm. Mina Perdita was built around 2000 BC. Manchai Bajo around 1700. Mm-hmm. Cardal maybe 1600. The others we don't know. But everyone was of the mind that Malpaso, because it was the most inland and the smallest of the temples, it had to right. be hands down the from, last one. They went from biggest to smallest. They went from coast up. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, yeah, it's the very last one. Probably a brief occupation. That didn't sit right with me because 
I mean, there's a logic to that thought process, but no, this is the temple I'm going to excavate now. I care about this little guy. I'm going to stick up for and say it's just as old as all the other ones. <laughs> and so I started excavating Malpaso to just find out that answer that question. When did people start migrating into the middle part of the Lorene Valley, which represents a different climate from the lower part? Mm -hmm. The middle area, it's a climate known as Chalpiyunga or arid desert. Yeah. By contrast to the coast or even the Andean highlands, there's no seasonal variability in this Chalpiyunga region. Hmm. So if I tell you right now that the weather is 72 degrees, zero humidity and not a cloud in the sky... That's the forecast not for today. <laughs> it's the forecast every day of the week. I wanted to find out when people first started permanently exploiting the resources of the Chalpiyunga mm -hmm. and then start to expand into these lar into a larger community that wasn't bound close to the temple. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anchikayu is the second site I, uh, I, um, on that list, and I didn't want to excavate that site to begin with. I had a list of five sites I wanted to excavate, including Malpaso, and Anchikai yeah. was not on there. What changed? Um, my cohort bullied me into it. <laughs> <laughs> the belief was that Anchikai was another U-shaped temple. Um, it has its own weird little mound, but I didn't buy it. It's not the same. It's hmm. shaped differently. It's smaller. There's a couple of atypical features. And when I went there, I could never find any early ceramics on the mound itself. It was always stuff that dated to the late horizon, so yeah. the Inca Empire, and a little bit beforehand. And I said, okay, I'll test it out if it's a temple. And if it's a temple, great. Then I got a, to think of a two-temple two model for yeah. this region, which would have been a lot of fun. If it, if it wasn't a U-shaped temple, I expected it not to have much of an early occupation. I could have ignored it off the map. Right. But it defied my expectations that way also because it turned out to be an early village. Based on the dates that we got from it, it looks like it was occupied shortly after Malpaso was established. Probably hmm. as early as 1500 BC for the first settlement there. I guess then you're kind of getting a different lens into the same period. You're getting a more of a household archaeology kind of Kind yeah, of view? that was the hope for uh, at excavating the villages. I wanted to get residential contacts where I could see what village life looked like. Yeah. And especially if I was able to identify different houses from around Malpaso versus what I found at Anchukai and Chiaco in particular. Mm -hmm. If the residential architecture matched, then we could say that this is an extension of that same culture group. It's just some people chose not to live near the temple. Right. Yeah. And in doing so, that begs the question of what's the relationship? Are they deeply religious but still had to go elsewhere to exploit more resources? Right, but happy to, say, make the trip for events to the temple or something, or they're maintaining good ties, or right, or, or yeah. is there a negative reason that they don't want to be... Yeah, you know, are they as lapsed from the Manchai culture as I am to Catholicism in that sense? Right. <laughs> what... Do you, do you feel like you have a, a take on that now? Yeah. The, the short answer is it's complicated. But the way that it is complicated shows that there was a definite relationship between these villages. And it varied from settlement to settlement. Mm -hmm. But they also expressed their autonomy in a number of crucial ways. Mm -hmm. I don't think that a lot of these settlements could have existed without the temples. Not as a matter of you need the authority of the temples. But these represent pioneer communities. They mm -hmm. laid the foundation for... Others, uh, other communities to do the same and thrive. Yeah. And then also it serves uh, as a larger network for connecting these communities and exploiting resources throughout the valley. Right. Going back to that organizational role. Yeah. Yeah. So I could imagine the villagers at Anchikai going to a festival, bringing their goods. And then when they get there, they know that the people at Malpaso, they're going to have razor clams galore so trade what they got to get some uh get some shellfish to enjoy mm -hmm. for a dinner maybe they meet some people from the highlands who are coming in from a different route trade yeah. for goods there and then you go back home and you you know enjoy your life otherwise okay actually this is a little bit of a tangent but in a few of the papers that i read and some of the readings you gave me i references were made to wear monsters Ah yes, and I was wondering if we could maybe take a tangent to what are what are the wear monsters in relation to the uh, temples of this period. So that gets to the name, <laughs> the Manchai culture, also. Yeah. Um, the, the name Manchai culture comes from two different places. The first is one of the temples that we find in the Lorene Valley, known as Manchai Bajo, and so. 
that was one of the three U-shaped temples that Richard Berger excavated in the 1990s and 1980s um, in the Lorraine Valley. Mm-hmm. But Manchai also is a catchwell word, which translates roughly to to be filled with a great terrifying feeling or to be filled with terror. And that is a very evocative term that fits with the type of iconography we see at uh, these temples. Yeah. One of the most famous examples of this type of Machai art are the polychrome friezes at Garagai, a mm-hmm. U-shaped temple in the Rimac Valley. Mm-hmm. It's uh, one of the ones that's also not very well preserved because it's located in the neighborhood known as San Martín de Porres. And after it was excavated by Roger Ravinas and Bill Isbell in the 1970s, it became a squatter's camp. Oh. Literally the day that's after. The squatters <laughs> told the archaeologists, yeah, the moment you clean out, clear out, we're moving oh, no. in. <laughs> and they trashed the site. Oh, geez. The friezes are not in great shape, yeah. but... At Garagai, there is a spider monster. There are parts of it that are a spider, parts of it that I think look like a shrimp, but uh, other people will tell you it's other animals. A feline snout of a nose. So you have all these different animals and a lot of them coming from the Amazon. Yeah. Bleeding together to create these fantastical monsters that become the iconography at all these temples. Another really good one is at Mina Perdita. A bottle gourd figurine that was buried behind the main pyramid. Yeah. And when their conservationist pulled it up, she reconstructed it and you see the same face. The eyes <laughs> are have these giant uh, dilated pupils that are inverted upwards like they're rolling into the figure's skull. The teeth yeah. are almost down to his chin. The arms, they're human-ish, but they also... They almost feel like uh, crocodile arms. You yeah. know, they're a little yeah. bit stubby. They got like, claws to them. And the, at the very base, there's a tail. The tail would have been more of a rattle, so you could, you know, wave the, this effigy during rituals. But to me, it just makes it even look more almost like it's pulling from Amazonian black caimans, which were another tropical hmm. iconographic influence for the culture. Yeah. I know that hallucinogens are commonly associated with shamans as a religious practitioner type. Uh, mediators between the sacred and the profane, using psychotropic drugs as a part of this um, is is that the case here? Is that a fair characterization? And and what about prehistorically? In the Amazon, that is absolutely true. Amazonian psychotropic plants have been an important part of these types of religious traditions for thousands of years, mm-hmm. even predating the Manchai culture, we believe. Mm-hmm. One of the godfathers of Peruvian archaeology is a guy named Julio Ceteo. Teo um, had a very interesting prediction in the 1930s and 1940s. He believed that the cradle of Peruvian civilization wasn't in the Andes Mountains. He believed it was in the Amazonian rainforest. And then 30 years later, you have Donald Lathrop, who, starting in the Ucayali Basin, he also came to the same idea. That the earliest evidence for complex society we're going to find in South America is in the Amazon, and then it travels over the mountains into the Pacific coastline. So those psychotropic plants become a way of connecting those religious traditions. And it's something that leads all the way into the um, successors of the Machai culture, uh, Chavinda Wantar and the mm-hmm. early horizon movement that we see yeah, in, yeah. throughout the Andes beginning around 800 BC. I've been so fascinated for a while by the way the religious can have such an organizational function in early human societies. Um, and and as an anthropologist, I, I've, I don't want to just say, like, with any given mythological or religious belief system, do I personally think it's objectively true? Yes or no? And if no, it's worthless to me. Mm -hmm. You can get get rid of it. Or it's sort of like a quaint sort of anachronism or something. But, like, seeing all of these really, like, kind of real-world consequences of of people's belief systems, you know, they're not insignificant. They They shape our present day in some truly frightening ways. Yeah. And as anthropologists, people who are, you know, rational, we are men of science, so to speak. (laughs) It can be a little disconcerting, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it shouldn't be because we also cling on to our beliefs, whatever they might be, and we justify them. I grew up irreligious, Mm -hmm. but as I've aged and thought about it more, I realize more and more, I think in a lot of ways, I'm quite religious. I don't often, it doesn't get labeled as often that way, but like... I've got all of these moral assumptions that are clearly inherited from a very from a very specific religious cultural tradition. 
this whole Judeo-Christian cultural milieu that I've uh, been steeped in since childhood. The like I've got all of these invisible organizing ideas floating around in my head for how I'm supposed to interact with other people around me, and um, I guess I've gotten a lot more conscious of those in the last few years. And, and yeah, yeah. So. And for as and for me in my background, it gets even a little bit more denser because I mean, aside from the Catholicism, there's mm-hmm. the fact that. As a Peruvian, mm-hmm. I've been exposed to Curandismo a lot throughout my life. Mm-hmm. My abuela, may she rest in peace, never would have, you know, overtly said it. But the, the housekeeper, she definitely had her folk traditions that she, you know, yeah. imparted on us, uh, on us, my mom yeah. and her brothers and sisters as well. And you don't think about that as part of a different tradition, but it totally was. And yeah. one that seamlessly bends with the Spanish Catholicism in ways that are very contradictory. Mm-hmm. And... When you when you when you acknowledge that, then you realize. I mean, there is in many cases there are, is a formal structure to religion that that does exist. Mm-hmm. But in a practical sense, religion is a series of contradictions that just kind of help make the world go round. Right. <laughs> the yeah. Manchai culture. It's yeah. a. I mean, I don't want to put too much projection onto them, mm-hmm. but they seem to be living a very contented life, which is centered around a religion that helps organize their social structure and manage water resources for an mm-hmm. early farming society. On the other hand, when you look at that iconography, you would think that they must be worshiping at the altar of HP Lovecraft and think yeah, the yeah. monsters are going to come and eat us alive and it's going to be terrifying. Yeah, why, why the monstrous iconography do you think? That's something that's hard to know for sure. It's easy to just kind of glibly say, oh, it's the drugs, but it's got to be so much more than that. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can identify Amazonian creatures in all of this shows that religion as we see in the Amazon and the Andes is a cultural transmission. You exchange these ideas and they get conflated into a variety of different symbols that fit the moment Hmm. and the people that we're looking at. Yeah. And then on the other hand, we also see the innovative capacity for the human mind to Mm -hmm. take all these things and combine them in really mind-melting ways. Chavin art in particular just shows that you can take one theme and twist it into a hundred different ways and produce something that's truly evocative. I mentioned uh, that Lathrop article, Our Father of the Cayman, Our Mother of the Bottle Gourd. Yeah. And that's a good example because Lathrop was evoking a very specific piece of art from Chavin, the Mm -hmm. so-called Teo Obelisk, which is a four-sided granite block, very tall, like about 10, 12 feet long. Mm -hmm. And carved into it are two crocodiles or caimans. One of them's male and the other's female. And on the back of each of them is a small child. This is the Amazonian creation myth. And it's a myth that, stop me if you've heard this before, but it starts with twin brothers <laughs> traveling in the wilderness all by themselves when they are encounter a almost protective animal creature. And right now you're thinking Romulus and Remus, right? I was about to ask, does one of them have to kill the other? <laughs> well, funny enough, not in Peru, but in Papua New Guinea, yeah. Oh, really? Because, yeah. So the crocodile, as the creature which our heroic first humans are ride on, yeah. it's not unique to South America. A version of this story can be found with certain groups in Papua New Guinea, and the story goes that when they uh, the two brothers reach the land, they get into a fight, one kills the other, and then he eats the remains of his brother. And hmm. this becomes the myth that then legitimizes cannibalism for those groups. Huh. Yeah. In West Africa, in uh, the Middle Niger Delta, the Dogon people have a similar myth saying that they, they reached uh, the Mandinga region, so where the Mande people are. Yeah. But they become part of the Mande because the first Dogon traveled on the back of a crocodile to reach uh, Mandingo. Huh. So you often see this idea of like a crocodile or a giant spiritual animal bringing the first people to land itself. And yeah. Lathrop then spins from that, showing that the reproductive organs of these two crocodiles on this piece of stone art, they represent the two most important crops for Amazonian, not Andean, um, mm-hmm. agriculture. The womb of the female crocodile is a bottle gourd. And that is very, very, very symbolic for Lathrop. And yeah. I would agree with him on that. And the other is that, for a lack of better terms, ejaculating from the male crocodile's penis is the sprouts of a manioc root. 
Oh, okay. And that cool. was the first staple crop that they were eating. So you could see that as huh. the seed of life, whereas yeah. the bottle gourd is the literal cradle of civilization. That is really cool. <laughs> yeah. So for as wild as that art is, it definitely does play on some really complex literary ideas, I would say. Yeah. And it shows just what type of capacity humans have for organizing and understanding their world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to fit by a logic that we have to clearly recognize, especially from a scientifically minded Western frame of thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're willing to kind of open up and think this is a way that people think, you can find a lot of richness and beauty into it. Yeah. Yeah. And especially life affirming for me is the fact that it's a tradition that still carries on in some capacity in modern day cultures. You see it in indigenous tribes that still live in the Amazon. Yeah. You find it in Peruvians who still will, you know, go to a fortune teller, even though they'll go to confession on Saturday. And you'll see it in the scholars like me and my colleagues who we do our Pagos de la Tierra because we might say we don't believe in the mountain spirits, but... Right, but if we look at your behavior, these beliefs are still living and acting on you. Yeah. Huh. And, and it, it really does feel like magic from time to time where yeah. you can't explain it, you can't describe it, you can't even put your finger on the basic feeling. You just know it's there. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, with that said, I think that's a pretty good note to end on, so... Yeah, thanks for taking the time, Chris. That was awesome. <laughs> Absolutely, Sebastian. I'm really glad that you came in. And so how long are you staying in Chicago? Thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.